church and the rest of us, if you would grab your Bibles and stand with me, turning your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. As we stand in honor of God's Word this morning, Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. The scripture reads, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering and forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called, one hope of your calling, one Lord, and one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended... What is it but that he also descended first to the lower parts of the earth? And he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above the heavens, that he might fill or fulfill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body and to the edifying of itself in love. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we bow before you again this morning. We thank you for the time of worship. We are so grateful for your amazing grace. As we think about your amazing grace, you get no better picture in that old rugged cross. And we are so thankful today that you didn't just die on the cross for our sin, but that you rose again to die no more. We're thankful, Lord Jesus, that you who are real and personal and active in our lives, we are so thankful. We want to worship you and adore you. I ask, Lord, as we look to your scriptures, that you'd hide me behind that cross, that you would be high and lifted up. And as you're high and lifted up, you draw men unto yourself. I pray for the Holy Spirit to give me an anointing and an unction from on high. And I ask your Holy Spirit to continue to work in the hearts of each person within the sound of my voice. And I pray you'd draw those that are lost unto yourself, that they might be saved. And I pray that you'd bring about revival amongst the hearts of those who are already saved. And we just ask you to move mightily this morning. May we be hearers and doers of your word. May we respond to you in obedience. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Last Sunday night, we were over in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, and we were talking about our walk with Christ. How is it that we are to walk? Well, the beginning of chapter 5 in verse 1, the apostle Paul to the church of Ephesus said, be followers of God as dear children. And so we talk about walking after Christ as dear children. Well, this morning, I'm going to back up one chapter to get to chapter four. I'm going to talk to you about walking worthy as you follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know what somebody might think right off the top of their heads. Well, I'm not worthy. Well, you're not by yourself. But that's why we have the grace of God and the mercy of God and the work of God that makes those who are sinners by nature who are subject to the wrath of God, who are unworthy in all in which we are and do, that makes us righteous, that makes us clean, that makes us worthy. And so when a person turns from their sin in repentance 
and turns to the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning that you're going down the direction of a broad path leading to the wrath of God, the lake of fire. When a person is on that path and everybody starts there, nobody starts in the middle row. Nobody is in the middle. They're just kind of on the fence line. When you're born in this world, you're born in this world of sinners. You're already in a state of condemnation. You're on the broad path Jesus talked about that leads to destruction. You're already headed that way. But repentance is when you realize you're on that path of destruction and you change your mind and therefore you turn around and you're looking now towards the cross. You're walking on the broad path that leads to a devil's hell. But when you turn around, uh, that path gets narrow and it points to the personal works that took place of the Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary. When a person repents, when a person calls on the name of Jesus, when a person is born again because they've received him as their own Savior and Lord, uh, he makes you worthy. He gives you new life. He starts a new work in your life. And you start out as a baby in Christ, but you are maturing in the faith. You're in Christ Jesus. And if we was to go over to chapter one, which we may eventually get there, but if you was to flip over there this morning to chapter one, you would find that in Christ Jesus, you are blessed with every spiritual blessing. In Christ Jesus, folks, is where it's at. Amen? It's in Christ. And so today I want to talk to you about walking worthy of that vocation wherewith you were called or that life that you were called to in Christ. That's what I want to talk to you about. When I think about our life in Jesus, folks, as I said, I'm making an assumption that you know Christ. All right? If you don't know Jesus as your own personal Lord and Savior, that's where we got to start. You've got to start by acknowledging your sin, as I already talked to you about. You've got to then turn to Christ, as I've said. You've got to understand that he is the one true and living God. Jesus is the one true and living God. He's always been, but he became a man. He went to his cross. He died in your place. He endured the wrath of the Father. He shed his blood, gave his life. Three days later, rose again so you could have eternal life. If you'll call on him this morning, Make a commitment to him. He will forgive you and save you. That's where it starts. But after a person gives their life to Christ, that is the beginning. Amen. That's not the ending of things. That's really when everything starts. And so with that being said, the apostle Paul, right in the church of Ephesus, as he was there in the city of Ephesus, had the opportunity to preach to them, share with them, see them, save, start a church. He writes back to them. He's writing back to them from a Roman prison cell. And he tells them, he says in verse one of chapter four, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. Literally, he was the prisoner of the Lord. The apostle Paul, who was once named Saul, who was a persecutor of the church, when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, it changed his life. And he went from being a persecutor of the church to be a preacher of the gospel to eventually receiving the persecution that he once gave because of his faith. And so he went from trying to put those in prison who followed Jesus to become a prisoner of himself, of the Lord Jesus. He said, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. How many understand that God has an expectation for us in our walk with him? He has a high expectation this morning, amen? I want us to understand that, that Jesus does not come down, save you, forgive you, cleanse you, go leave, go to prepare a place for you to one day he's going to come again, receive you unto himself. And in the meantime, between the transaction of you getting saved and his return, he's just going to leave you to how you are with no expectation. That's not what it's all about, folks. Jesus comes into our life as the good shepherd hunting out the lost sheep. When we, when we hear the voice of the shepherd and we come to him, then we begin to follow him and he begins that good work in us and he begins to mold us and shape us unto himself and he puts us a part of the body of Christ. We'll talk about that in a moment. But he puts us in the body of Christ and with other believers, he is doing a work as we represent him in this lost, dying world. We've got to walk, folks. 
We've got to work. We have got a responsibility and an expectation of the Lord Jesus Christ that is a whole lot higher than any of us uh, really put on ourselves. You know, as, as a pastor, I've been pastoring for a long time now, the sad reality is this. The expectation of folks is very little. Oh, um, man, if you get somebody to show up to worship service once every month, man, you, you, as a preacher, oh, that's exciting. What? You know, if, if, if you and I in our walk with someone else, was, well, our, our kids, or our spouse, or our friends, or whatever it may be, it, it's just once a month we say hello, once a month we call, once a month we're there to take care of somebody, that's not a very good relationship. But what we do find is that God has an expectation Pastors have lowered expectation. Churches have lowered expectation. Individual members have lowered expectation. We, we look around and we see what others are doing or not doing and we think that we are accomplishing something in our walk when the reality is, folks, the standard in which we are to follow is the Lord Jesus himself. And he is a God who, he, when he took on human form, God in the flesh, the son of God, God, the, the man, God, man, he came to do the will of the father, the first person of the Trinity. And I'm thankful that the Lord Jesus went all the way to the cross of Calvary to do the father's will. He didn't back up. He didn't slow up. In fact, as a 12 year old little boy, you remember when he was at the temple and, and, and his earthly parents were on their way back and they got to looking around. So where's Jesus at? And when they went back, Jesus said, you know where I'm at. I'm here to do my father's business. At the age of 12, he was doing his father's business. Folks, we ought to see that there is an expectation. In verse 1, we find that the apostle Paul said that he wants us to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. When we talk about walking with Jesus, when we're talking about living for Christ, it is time for us to be so committed that we're living up to the standard of walking worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. And understand that salvation is a calling. He calls you to salvation. But after you get justified, forgiven of your sin, and you start the process of sanctification, there is a calling to walk with Jesus. There is a calling for us to live for Christ and be committed to him. And there's a high standard. You want to walk worthy. You and I are going to give an account before God. Saved people are going to stand before him in the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to give an account of what we've done in this body, whether it be good, whether we be bad. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, you can look at that. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 he tells us that our works will be put upon the altar, will be tried by the fire of God, and the things that are of God, the things that, that, that are of, of works that were, were of silver and gold, so to speak, of precious stones, they will be purified. But the things like wood, hay, and stubble, they're going to burn up and we're going to suffer loss. And though the soul will be saved, we'll be tried as if by fire. Peter says judgment starts at the house of God. When we think about the responsibility of a saved person, God's calling us to walk a life that is worthy of the calling of salvation. Now you can't work to be saved and you can't work to stay saved. But by the grace and the mercy of God, folks, we ought to be walking to display our salvation. All that we do, whether we live or whether we die, all things should be done unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? I mean, think about that for a minute. That's motivating, isn't it? When you sit and think about the fact that we're supposed to be doing all things as unto the Lord Jesus, everything. If you're a teacher, you gotta teach like you're teaching Jesus. You say, well, he already knows it all. That means you better study up, amen? Huh? If you're, if you're here today and, and you're somebody who is being taught, guess what? You ought to be, be, ought to be receiving the word like you're receiving it from Jesus. And, and that's, in essence, you are too. But when your teacher's teaching, you ought to be a student that's paying attention. When the preacher's preaching, you ought to be paying attention. And, you know, no matter how young or old you may be, you know? If you're giving today, you ought to give back as in you want to give back in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's just what we're supposed to do. If you serve in whatever capacity it may be, it is me as unto the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. And Paul said, I am saying that as a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what Paul learned to do? He learned to be content in whatever state he was in because he learned to live for Jesus no matter what was going on. If the man was in chain in a prison cell, he was going to be a prisoner for Jesus Christ. If he was free to go about Asia Minor, going to every place that he could go to to preach the gospel, Jew and Gentile alike, he was going to go with that freedom and preach Christ crucified and him raised from the dead. He's going to call all people to repentance and come trust in Jesus. When he sees folks get saved, he's going to do all he can to help build up the local church where he is at. And the apostle Paul was doing all things as unto the Lord Jesus Christ. When folks would look at our life and examine our lives, they'd say, you know what that person is doing? That person is committed to Jesus Christ. When they look at us as a whole, as a church, they'd say, that church is committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we know that? Because they are following after Christ with consistency, with persistency. A a people that are putting the word of God first. A people who are wanting to follow the teachings of the scripture. People are willing to tell others about Jesus. People that are willing to make the necessary sacrifice to live for Christ. Paul said that he is crucified daily. He said, nevertheless, I live. Not that I live, but I now live by the faith of the son of God who died for me. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you're going to have to take up your cross. You're going to have to die to yourself. You're going to have to live for him. For a man who tries to save his life will lose it, but a man who loses his life for my sake shall live. Folks, we got to be a committed people unto the calling of our walk with the Lord Jesus. Then he goes on to say how we do that. He says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering." Now think about that for a minute. When you get to live for Jesus, is it because you and I deserve it? No. Remember, we're not worthy by ourselves, But in Christ Jesus, we find our worth. In Christ Jesus, we find our righteousness. In Christ Jesus, we find eternal life. In Christ Jesus, we have hope when there is no hope. In Christ Jesus, folks, is how we've overcome the world. And so when we talk about living for Christ, we ought to do that in a way that's that's showing that we are, that, that he's worthy. Walk in worthiness, as he says, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, but do it with all lowliness, with humility. Why? Because you're saved by grace. You're not saved because you're good. God did not look down from heaven in eternity past and say, oh, so-and-so down there is worthy to go to my heaven, so I better go down there and die for him. That's not what happened. You know what it was? God looked in eternity past, and he looked upon sinful humanity because he knew exactly what was going to take place, and what took place happened, and he looked upon sinful humanity. You know what he saw? He saw humanity deserving the lake of fire that was never made for humanity, was made for Satan and his angels, but because of our own willful sin and our own sin nature, we are deserving of the wrath of the Father. But in spite of the fact that we were sinners, God so loved the world that he sent forth his son. So God the Father sent forth God the Son to take on the sin of humanity, to go to the rugged cross, to endure the wrath of the Father. And then he buried it, took it away, and then rose again to die no more. And when that happened, folks, well, those who call on Jesus have forgiveness of sin and eternal life, all completely upon the personal works of Jesus alone. That's why it's amazing grace. That's why it's amazing grace. It's not about anything that we could give. And so when we live for Jesus, shouldn't it be in humility? Shouldn't we, when we're living for Christ, walk in a way that show that Jesus is worthy of our commitment, but we also ought to be walking in a way of humility, of lowliness. But we realize that it is a privilege and an honor to live for Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says that we are ambassadors of Christ. He says that he has given us the word of reconciliation and the ministry of reconciliation. That we are ambassadors. That we are to be people who are speaking on behalf of our God in this old lost dying world. 
Man, that's a big responsibility. But that ought to humble us. That, that, ought, to, that ought to help us realize that folks, you and I, uh, our, our, our our, our, our worth, our, our righteousness is in Christ. And therefore, we ought to be a people who are humble and lowly in our walk with Jesus. We ought to, we ought to be committed in a way that we're going to do all things from the Him, but we ought to be a people who are lowly. What a meekness. Meekness is, is, is strength harnessed. It's power under control. When we think about meekness, it's like, on these big horses that are there for work horses. And these horses are, are, are tamed and they're harnessed and they got the bridle in their mouth and they got all that that they got and they're, they're, they're hooked up and they're doing what they're supposed to be doing and working. You and I can't control that power by itself, but when you harness that power and accomplish what it's supposed to, you and I are to be under the harness of the Lord Jesus he said it like this as we get yoked up with him and in our Sunday school class, we learned some things. And, and Jesus said this of life. He said, all ye are burdened and heavy laden. Come unto me and I'll give you rest. He said, learn of me and take on my yoke for it's easy. You know what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to get yoked in with Jesus. We're supposed to follow after him and we're supposed to live a life in meekness. How many understand that the same Holy Spirit that was present at the resurrection of Jesus is the same Holy Spirit that comes inside the life of someone who is born again. The power, the dunamis, the dynamite power of the Spirit of God abides within the life of a believer who enables us, empowers us to live for Jesus. But we are to do that, not power out of control, but in meekness. We're to be humble, and understand that we're saved by the grace of God. We get to live for Jesus by the grace of God. And then we ought, to, we ought to live in power, but it needs to be under control. It needs to be a people who are meek. Jesus was meek, right? And the Bible says in Matthew, I believe it's chapter five, where he said that the meek shall inherit the earth. What does that mean? That those who have surrendered themselves under the mighty hand of God, those folks will he lift up? Those folks will he empower? Those folks can live a life of victory in the Lord Jesus? We're to be a people who are walking worthy. We're to be a people who are walking in humility, lowliness. We need to be a people who are walking in meekness, but also a people who are walking in love towards one another. Look what it says in the next part of verse two. In long suffering. Who are you long suffering with? Jesus? No. No, no reason to have to worry about living in long suffering with Jesus. Because has he ever done you any wrong? No. And you, know, you get up this morning and you're upset about something or mad about something or go through life and have a difficulty. Let me tell you. Let me tell you right now, folks. It's God did nothing wrong. He has never done a thing wrong. You, you can say, well, I don't know about that, Brother Anthony. I mean, I've had this go on and that go on and God did this or God done that. Listen. I'm here to tell you that the one true and living God of the scripture is good all the time. And the one true and living God of the scripture is perfect in all his ways. The one true and living God is sovereign. He is in control, but he also made man free moral beings. He also allowed the possibility of man sinning and man did. And so because of that, sin's in the world. Also, Satan is in the world. So the evil's in the world. There's a lot of negative things that are here in the world that's contrary to the ways of God. God is good and God is perfect and God is right in all of his things. And so when we think about God and you have to be long suffering, who is he talking about then? Well, he goes on to say in the end of the verse, forbearing one another in love. We learned in our Sunday school class this morning as well that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, all that you are. You love God with all your heart. They asked, they asked Jesus, what's the greatest of all the commandments? And he said, that was the greatest. And he said, the second one is likened unto the first one. And it was love your neighbor as yourself. He would go on to say that all the law and the prophets hang on those two principles. You talk about narrowing it down, boiling it down, get it down to, to so somebody like me who's not the sharpest can understand it. That's what Jesus did. 
He brought every bit of the, the commands of God, all, every bit of the law of Moses, and all, every bit of the sermons of the prophets. And he said, this is what it amounts to, folks. You love God with all that you are. And then you love your neighbor as yourself. That's, that's it. You look at the Ten Commandments, they're, they're, they're grouped into two categories. Your relationship with God and your relationship with others. When you look at the cross of Calvary, you got one beam pointing up in your walk with God. You got another beam pointing horizontally your, your walk with others. When you think about what Jesus is, is telling us here through the apostle Paul, that when we walk with God, well, our walk needs to be one worthy of him, one that's in humility, one that's in meekness, but also one that's in love. You're going to be long suffering with each other. We need to forbear one another. How? In love. We need to learn how to deal with each other. Amen? Because Jesus died on the cross for who? The sin of the entire world. Jesus died on the cross for all who will call upon his name. And when a person gets saved, they become part of the family of God. I remember when Jesus was told, hey, your brothers, your sisters, your mama's outside, wants to talk to you. He's right in the middle of his ministry. He said, who is my mother? Who is my brother? Who is my sister? But those who do the will of my father. Jesus understood exactly the family of God is. When you read in John chapter one and verse 12, he says, but as many as the received him to them gave you the power to become the sons of God or the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. When you and I get saved, we become part of the body of Christ, the church of almighty God. And we are saved by grace, kept by grace. And guess what? We're in it together. And we got to learn how to walk with Jesus in light of that. And we got to learn how to forbear one another. We got to learn how to be long suffering with one another. We got to do it in the love of Christ. Just as Jesus loved us, are we to love others? That's what the Bible teaches. That's what God's talking about here in our walk. You can't walk by yourself. You know that? You are empowered by the Spirit of God. You're to follow the steps of Christ under the leadership of the Word of God. But we got to walk with each other. We're part of the family of God. He says, you and I are to walk in love, in love with another, each other. Also, we're to walk in the spirit or in the unity of spirit. Look what it says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. You remember what Jesus told his disciples? He says, people are going to know you're my disciples when you love one another. Well, what's the display that you love one another? Well, you're in unity. We are to be of one mind and one accord. What does that mean? Does that mean that you and I are just to get along for the sake of getting along? No, I've never been that type anyway. Usually I'll tell you that, you know, just to get along to get along. Does that mean that you and I just go about and, and for the sake of unity, just accept whatever's coming and going? No, that's not what that means. What does it mean then? How do you come together in unity? We got to understand there's some authority that's bigger than you and me. If you come to know Jesus as your own personal Lord and Savior, Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. In Romans chapter one and verse 16, Paul said he wasn't ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because the power of God unto salvation. So if faith comes by the word of God, salvation, of course, comes through the word of God. Then, then what is the authority? The word of God. So how do we come together in unity? How do we walk in unity? We walk according to the principles of the scriptures. Amen. And that means that the preacher's got to get out of the way. The other leadership's got to get out of the way. You're, you you got to get out of the way. That means that our own thoughts, our own feelings, our own philosophies, that means that the world and what all their teachings got to get out of the way. And the word of God has got to be the final authority. If we're going to walk in a manner that's pleasing to God, we've got to walk in unity. And as we walk, endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit, that means that you and I have made a conscious decision that thus saith the Lord, period. And I've got to line up with it. That's how you can have people of different ages, different walks of life, different likes, dislikes, Everybody's different. Different nationalities come from different cultures. You know, I'm from Ohio. 
Now I came down here, different culture. I got saved at First Baptist Church, South Lebanon, just about 45 minutes away from where I grew up. Whole different culture. Just a whole different culture. Oh, we ain't looked the same, but we were different. So how can different people of different backgrounds, of different ideas, of all kinds of differences from social statuses to to education levels to all kinds of things. How can those types of people come in unity? I mean, if you got two people, you got two different opinions, don't you, Brother Anthony? I mean, if you put a handful of folks together, you can't get everybody to agree on that. Well, you know what? That's why we are to strive or endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. How do you do that? By understanding that the inspired and errant and fallible Word of God is the final say-so. And so if you're male, female, white, black, red, yellow, rich, poor, um, educated, uneducated, if you're somebody who has common sense, it's not so common anymore. If you're somebody who's got book smarts, but you can't walk around, it don't matter. So what do you mean somebody got book sense, they can't walk around? There's plenty of folks real smart and can't walk around. You know what I'm talking about? So how do we come together then? Right here. Right here. So you mean when, when, when we have a disagreement, when I think this way and you think that way, that the Bible should be the final say? That's exactly what I'm saying. It shouldn't be what some modern day individual out here tries to say. I don't care what the latest politician says. I don't care what the latest scientist says. I could care less about what the rest of this world has to say about much anything. You know why? Because most of what they're saying, I'm going to tell you what it's doing, it's in complete opposite to the Word of God. And you're telling me, Brother Anthony, that this book that was written by by men of thousands of years ago should have a standard above anything and everything today. Absolutely. That's what I'm saying. And so folks who who, who like you and me today, if we're going to walk together endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, we have got to come under the authority of the Word of God. That's how we have to live. That's how we have to walk. That's, how, that's what it comes down to. This has to be the final say. See, if you and I are going to walk for, with Jesus, who, who are we supposed to be striving for? Him, right? Him. We'll be committed to Him. Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. We walk in light of our commitment to Him. If we're going to do it with humility, we're doing it in light of him, right? He's the one that died for you and rose again. You did nothing to add to your salvation. You do nothing to keep yourself. You, do, you add nothing to the nature of God. I mean, we are the sole beneficiary when it comes down to the work of Almighty God. He doesn't look and say, you know what? Oh, man, Anthony just adds so much to me. He does not say that. I promise you that. He's going to say, I've had to do everything for that guy. You know? But the way he does it, he, he, he's like, I know what he is. I know what he was. I know what he is. I know what he's going to be. I'm the one doing the work in his life. That's how he does for us. So we got to do it in humility and meekness. Well, we got to be long suffering. We got to walk in love, we got to walk in unity. You know, if you and I will strive to walk in unity, it's amazing what can take place. When I put you first, you put me first. We work together under the headship of Jesus and the authority of the word of God. That's how you can have some peace. That's how you can have some, 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 uh, a, a group of people to go out here and make an impact in this world. You think the disciples always got along? They didn't. They didn't all come from the same background. There were several fishermen, you know, but they had tax collectors. They had other folks that, that were involved. How did they come together? Under the head of Jesus. They had, and that's the same thing for us. How can we make a difference? Under the head of Jesus. We've got to endeavor for the, to strive for the unity of the Spirit. And then it says, in the bond of peace. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Now, don't hear me out and think I'm saying that, that oh, well, whatever for peace. Just like forever, whatever for unity. That's not what I'm saying. 
Even Jesus himself said, I didn't come to bring peace, I come to bring sword. And you know what he said? He said, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. Hello? You ever wonder why you can't get along sometimes? Well, there you go. Daughter-in-law, mother-in-law, mother-in-law, father-in-law, son-in-law. What is, what is his point there? It wasn't that he doesn't want the in-laws not to get along. Jesus' point was that the word of God is going to be the deciding factor, the defining factor, and the dividing factor. That I'm going to walk in peace and unity with you under the lordship of Jesus as the scripture teaches. This is how we can walk in peace. It's under the authority of the scripture. We've got to learn how to walk. When you go to chapter five in verse one, he said, be ye followers of God as dear children. What does a child do when they're younger? Most, I mean, they have their little spells. But most children do what they're told by their parents as it starts out. Now, I'm not saying they don't get older and then they start thinking they're smarter and all that. I know how it works. I went through the phase. I got three kids my own. They go through their phase. But kids, when they're little, they see their parents. They see their parents, somebody that loves them, takes care of them, protects them. They think they, they do what their mom and dad tells them to do. You know, be as children. Jesus, when he was bringing all the kids, they wanted to bring the kids. And his disciples said, come on, he ain't got time for them. And he said, suffer not the little children coming to me. He said, except you become as a child and be converted, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You have to become as a child, a childlike faith. You've got to respond that way. When we talk about following, we need to follow the Lord because he said in his word. He's God. We're not. He's the, he's the creator. We're the created. He's the perfect one. We were the sinners saved by the grace of God. He is the one that comes inside of us. He has given us his word, preserved it throughout time, and it's going to stand when the rest of the world just fails away. But he, his word's going to stand. And so he told, tells us that we are to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit, but he said do it in the bond of peace. He said, because it's just one body. We got to walk also in the church. You ever wonder why your preacher harps on the importance of being involved in the local church? Oh, well, Brother Anthony, if, if, if you don't, then who are you going to preach to? Well, that's a good question. I won't preach to nobody. And sometimes I think, as I told you before, sometimes I think some people just don't shift work around here. Oh, you got next week? Okay, I got the next week. Are you going to come two weeks in a row? Shh, I don't know if I can do that, but I'll show up on the third week. But you know why I encourage you and challenge you and preach about being involved in a local church? Because it's just one body. Now you say, hold on a second, there's local churches everywhere. But the local churches make up one body. We can't be everywhere at one time. But you can be in a local church where God has set you up to be. We got to be together. We got to walk together. There is no such thing as, as somebody walking alone. It doesn't work that way. You cannot be what God wants you to be if you're not involved in the body. There's one body, he said, one spirit. Even as you're called by one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who's above all and through all and in you all. That's why he talks about being in unity. Why? Because it's just one. Got to learn to walk together. Listen, church, if you're saved by the grace of God, that's how you're part of the church. We got to get to walking. We, we, we've, got, we've got to get on a, a program in which we are walking for Christ. That's what we've got to do. We've got to be a people that realize that the one who saved me is worthy of my commitment in this walk. That's where it has to start. Jesus is worthy. And you're to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Jesus is worthy of our commitment. And you and I need to walk in a manner that shows that we are worthy. We're found in him. We need to do it in Humility. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? Those who do are the servants of all. That's who the greatest. I know it's different than what we think in this old world. 
In this old world, the greatest is the one that seems to be able to say whatever and just get it done. Well, Jesus is the greatest. But guess what he did? He came in as a servant. He humbled himself. He took on the role of a servant. He came not to do his own will, but the will of the Father. He went and he took our place. He died for people who are ungodly. He died for people who are his enemies. He died for people who did not love him. And he rose again, overcoming their sin, that he could change those people by his grace, by his power, by his mercy, by his work. We've got to start to walk, folks. What about you today? How's your walk? Is it in unity or discord? Think about that for a minute. If you're to walk in unity, the opposite's discord. And there's been plenty of folks over the years of ministry that I've seen. But I'm also like, you know what? If this is what we say, I'm doing the opposite of that. Well, we need to get in the book, follow the scriptures and get in unity. Come together in peace. Come together in the head of Christ and walk together where Christ can be glorified, where a lost and dying world can be impacted. We've got to walk together. Amen? I mean, isn't, isn't there something that, that makes a difference in a walk? I mean, think about it for a minute. And then we're going to miss Stephanie. Go ahead and make your way on up here. Think about this for a minute. If, if somebody wants to make something aware in our community, what do they do a lot of times? They do walks, don't they? You know, we have a walk for life. To, to, to make awareness of the, that of the sanctity of human life and, and to raise money to combat things such as abortion and, and help the, these, these folks that have pregnancies that are in crisis situations and we want to minister to them in the name of Christ. So there's walks. If, if, if there's something going on, something new, somebody has some sickness that's coming to a, a, a forefront in, in, a, in a community or whatever it may be, time, there's walks to bring awareness now let me tell you something. It's time for the church to wake up and to start walking and to start letting this world know that, that we need Jesus, amen? That they need Jesus. That, that Jesus is coming again. That judgment is around the corner. That eternity is forever. And that the only way you're going to heaven is to be born again, have a relationship with Jesus. And if you don't come that way, the lake of fire is forever. Well, you've got to get to walking, folks. We got to walk in a manner that's pleasing to our Lord. What about you? How are you walking today? You know, we're all on a path. Are you on the broad path that leads to destruction or are you in the narrow path that leads to life? You know, if you're on the path that's leading to life, are you walking a manner that is pleasing to your Lord and to your Savior? If not, how come? Are you somebody just wanting to just to get by, are you making a difference? Us as a church, as a whole, we're walking together, we're stepping together in unity. We're going in the way of Christ under his head, under his leadership, under his word. What about you today as we walk with Jesus? Let's pray. Father, we bow before you this morning, ask you to move during the invitation. Ask you, Lord, that uh, as you've spoke to our hearts, if there's somebody here today that's lost and needs to be saved, I pray they'd realize they need to turn where they're at in their walk and turn to you. That they're on that broad path that leads to destruction. They're on their way to a devil's hell. But you take no desire in the death of the wicked, but you desire all men to be saved. And that you're dealing with them today for them to turn in their, their walk and turn around about face in repentance. And that they're to come to you, call on you, give their life to you, that they would be saved. For us who are saved, Lord, I pray that we'd examine our walk and our commitment to you and to your church, to the furtherance of the gospel. Are we walking worthy, the vocation wherewith you have called us to? I pray, Lord Jesus, we'd be a people who evaluate ourselves, and then we come and do business with you as individuals. I pray, Lord Jesus, that that we would examine ourselves as a church and we would be about your business as we come and get right with you as we need to. We just ask you, Lord, to do a work that we will get up and we will take the steps that we need to take that we might be walking in a manner that's pleasing to you. 
being a follower of the Lord Jesus as a dear child of God. So I ask you, Lord, just to move during the invitation, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.